Today's episode of Market Talk is brought to you in part by Growmark FS. Keeping up on the latest in ag is a challenge to say the least, but there are experts nearby ready to help. You'll find them at your local FS. You can trust them to bring you customized agronomic grain and energy solutions born of the latest thinking. That's because FS specialists receive continuous training that keeps them current on the latest trends, practices, and technologies. So you'll get local expertise that's both exceptional and up to date. Visit FSSystem.com to learn how FS is bringing you what's next. And a good afternoon. Welcome into Market Talk for this Monday, July 12th. Great to have you here. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Thanks for joining us as always, MarketTalkAg.com. That is our home on the web, MarketTalkAg.com is where you can find us. All of our social media links, our streaming sources for Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and more. Everything, one-stop shop, MarketTalkAg.com. Well, we have a July WASDI report out. It's rare we have a WASDI on a Monday. It's been a while, but it was a uh, interesting way to start the week and a lot of uh, bullish momentum after the report, and we settled up today. Let's talk about all of it. Let's bring in our good friend Brian Doherty with Total Farm Marketing today. Brian, great to have you on, and uh, I hope you had a good fourth uh, look at it today. Man, oh, man, it was uh, it was fun and interesting to come back here to start the week with a with a big WASDI report, wasn't it? Well, it was, uh, Jess, and thank you, by the way. Um, Did have a good fourth. Uh, Last week was a bit rough in the marketplace. The price is down every day, but a nice nice turn today. Good, strong... gains finishes and 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 we like to see that you know the 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 close is what counts but that corn up 15 16 cents a nice recovery after losing over 60 cents last week soybean solid at 20 25 higher wheat kind of the big winner today again with you know big big reductions in spring wheat and just overall numbers of wheat a little bit of a surprise to the marketplace so that was really the leader there uh but you know looking back at this corn um Kind of an interesting weekend. You had rain forecast for the northwestern regions of the Midwest. Uh, just the amounts were not what was expected. Others in the Midwest received what we're going to call outstanding rain. But again, it was scattered in variety. And the haves and the have-nots, or at least the haves and the have-some. And the need for more rain. That west-northwestern region looks again to be above normal in its temperature, below normal in precipitation. Yeah, a lot of interesting things to unpack here. And uh, uh, let's start with spring wheat, a little deeper dive there. I know you mentioned that and that number coming in today, 345 million bushels on other spring wheat production. And that's you know, compost spring wheat, Durham, all those things. That's how USDA does it. Um, but that was around 100 million bushels below the lowest pre-report estimate, it sounded like. So it just seemed like that was a confirmation of the challenges and the problems we're having in that spring wheat belt. <laughs> Yeah, anytime you get a number that's outside the range, that tells you something. Uh, and the something is simply what I think a lot of uh, people have told us, farmers in, the, in those regions, and then just people who um, really pay attention just didn't, didn't think that maybe the USDA last month had a, had enough of a weather concern already factored in. And, and to the USDA's, let's call it credit, they usually don't jump real fast because everyone knows that dry weather quickly turn into less than dry weather or maybe wet weather. But um, but you've got an issue with that part of the country. It's been bone dry since last year, basically. The entire western regions of the nation stay bone dry. Pasture conditions aren't very good. Uh, those come out every week. We can see those numbers there. Um, and so when you look at the crop ratings weekly on on spring wheat they have just been horrible um and remember spring uh, uh, spring wheat goes all the way back to washington state and idaho too were just huge drought regions so so jesse yeah surprise but maybe not nice to see the market respond though spring wheat uh closed within pennies of the contract high fill the gap today and looks like it's ready to to shoot into new highs yeah, I was going to mention that as well. Just about a penny off that contract high in the day, eight fifty seven and a quarter, and uh, you know a lot of uh, a lot of growers they're wondering if nine dollars is next in spring wheat, and it's very possible, Brian. Oh, I, 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 you know, today just pushes a whole bunch of of life into that contract, and uh, I think it's it's just it, it's almost destined to get there. So they don't know guarantee, and you know, I heard people last week talking the week before about corn, you know, uh, 650, 675, and 
you know, it's all kind of analogies of how easy that'll be to get there. And we saw just the opposite, but, but I'll tell you, you know, it's been uh, something that has been brewing from the supply side. That is, you just, you know, don't have dry weather overnight. It, it's multiple months of this and weeks of this and above normal temperatures. And then when the rain did hit, in particular, North Dakota, uh, let's go back about a month ago, you had just copious heavy rains in some areas, but it was stationary. Other mm -hmm. areas didn't get any rain. So the crop just continued to erode despite some of the crop getting better. The overall net of the crop and the weekly crop ratings got uh, uh, continued to decline. Yeah. And I know as well, Chicago and Kansas City wheat were higher today as well. I know global ending stocks uh, a little bit lower there for the new crop for all wheat. Uh, but overall, that wheat market, again, the story, it seems like, was in spring wheat here today, Brian. Uh, let's shift gears over to corn. That Brazil number came in today, 93 million metric tons, five and a half million lower than last month. Um, we've kind of figured that as well not really a surprise we figured usda was going to have to lower that number a little bit but how does that figure into the corn side of the equation here today well i today is maybe one of those days where it's what the report didn't say jesse so mm -hmm. so the report kind of confirmed what i think all these private analysts have been saying for a couple of months but the report didn't leave that brazil crop number unchanged um so that was important so it's what the report didn't say it didn't it didn't say same old same old they took into account uh, uh maybe a month later than most people would have preferred but they took into account the serious dry weather conditions that have uh, hampered that second crop the lateness to the crop and it just adds, um, it adds just, a, you know, again, a little bit more of a confirmation of a tightening tone of world supplies in a, in a period of time where the world's coming out of COVID and demand uh, is kind of rampant in a lot of areas for things. Um, those things being you know, food and uh, fuel and you're seeing energy prices uh, near, you know, highs for the year and, and you're seeing food demand um, very strong worldwide. Um, so, so, um, nice to see that, that we've got some reports today that I think are reflective of tightening. The key is the trend of inventory. It's tightening and not getting larger. Yeah. And looking at, you know, at, uh, corn yield, soybean yield, no changes there. Um, that was, that was expected. Ending stocks, soybeans, no change there. Ending stocks for corn went up a little bit, but that was expected with the acreage estimates and everything. So really, it seems like all the other numbers in the WASD, no surprises at all, Brian, to me anyway. Yes, the, the, the old line is like somebody kicked the can down the road. Uh, we'll see what next month brings and actually get. Now you're going to start getting, you know, into this late July, August, and um, a lot of, I think field surveys whether they're just guys walking their field and saying no it looks better than usual or worse or my ears aren't there or something to actual um you know very organized type um tours and so we'll get a lot more information but you know you brought the beans there again the carry out number unchanged again it's what the report didn't say it didn't add 50 or 100 million um it's keeping things tight and considering how high prices have been that's pretty reflective of tight inventory. It's just, it, it, it's, it, you know, not where, where we've gotten the path of, you know, finding out that, oh, maybe these numbers were wrong. And you, they do some surveys and find out that, oh, well, we, we added 100 million bushels to beans. We haven't at all. Nothing. You go back to January, that number is within 5 million bushels of 140 million in, on this old crop. So pretty amazing how how tight that supply is as the year wears on remember the marketing year ends august 30th you've got some time yet you know that's not a lot of beans to be spread out through the united states in storage very very true and i look at the closes here on monday december cord 533 november beans 1350 and a quarter you look at some of these levels and i know we were testing some support levels here at the end of last week what are your thoughts on these quarter bean markets with where these price levels are at, getting these numbers in, looking at the forecast, just kind of a uh, look ahead here the next uh, couple of days or so. I mean, do we? does it look like we have some room for this top side to be open again? Well, there's a gap on the charts that was left at the beginning of last week after the 4th of July in, in corn. And certainly that has some room to, to, uh, to, to maybe move up to into that gap area. But just to kind of keep it simple, the market peaked 
in early May, over $6, 638. Peaked again in June, over $6, 628. And then peaked again in, um, in July and peaked on July 1st at over $6. So not much of an appetite above $6, but the board itself right now is, is uh, well, where are we at? December 533. If you really think about it, we're, we're, we're to the 12th of July. And so we've had some $6 corn on dry weather concerns and weather concerns. We've taken some of the weather premium out. But really, we've been hovering around this 550. You can make the argument for four months now, give or take. And so that's probably where we try and settle out a little more, maybe gain some of this back. I don't think that the crop is going to be proven on tonight's crop ratings. I don't think it's going to prove that the crop's still going downhill. It stabilized last week at 64% good, excellent, where there have been good rain, some areas too much. At this time of year, when I hear too much rain, that means, you know, a lot of areas are benefiting. So I don't want to take away from the, the guys that get too much, but, um, you know, the old saying is there's two hills for every valley. So, um, so Jesse, in the end, you know, probably around 525, 550 is where December is priced. If we have some weather adversity, it won't take long to get back above 550. But if it tips over, you know, it's getting later in the year. There will be a point here where the end user just says, I see all this corn out in the field. It's tasking. It looks good. I'm going to back away from the market. That's what I'd be concerned with if I'm a producer and we don't see a really adverse weather forecast. For sure. For sure. Soybean side briefly. I know we still have some time weather wise, you know, that crop more made in August. Uh, but soybeans, you know, from what we're hearing, looking OK, still have that time. And again, like you alluded to, it's not going to be made off uh, the crop ratings we have later on today either. It's not, and, and and there's you know other focuses as well. When you have tight inventory and strong export sales, we'll be looking. We had export inspections today out as well, so we didn't get anything out of the WASI report. We'll have to look at crop rates. There's a lot of the bean crop that that's kind of on that bubble, that's fair or poor, or very poor. But it, it, beans can have the luxury of kind of looking poor. But if they get the right weather in latter latter half of July and August, they can still yield out very well. In fact, I had a conversation with the farmer today, so I've got some beans that are, you know, boot high and some that are waist high. And we came to the conclusion that either, they, I mean, they could yield the same. So just don't really know yet in beans, a lot of uncertainty and, and some time needed with critical weather late July, August, uh, yet ahead. For sure, for sure. Let's uh, look over livestock here for a little bit as well. I know uh, hogs today uh, higher for the most part here, but hogs also um, were a little disappointment there with pork exports and imports unchanged from last month on the WASD report. Did you take much stock into that? Uh, what do you see today? Um, I, I didn't. You know, what I see is consolidation. We, we saw a hog market that, that I guess I would argue when it's higher priced than cattle, it's not going to last for long at 120. And, and it didn't. Um, cracked down pretty hard. I guess I would argue is trying to consolidate. I like the 112 in, in July. I think you got to have more demand chasing the markets up against the 40 and 50 day moving average. When I look at the August at 104 up 250 today, nice recovery, but general consolidation. It does have a big gap to fill up around 112. So it'll be interesting to see if, if July can hold together and cash can hold together. August makes a run at that. But, but keep in mind, we're from a historical perspective, we're getting closer to a time of the year where, where typically hog slaughter numbers get bigger and demand starts to wane a little bit. And, that, and, and, and historically, late summer, early fall has usually been a kind of a tough window to own hogs or to be long futures, ultimately a good area to buy. Um, so any consolidation or recovery we get now, we probably view that as a you know, not a gift, but something that may not last. And over in cattle, uh, feeder cattle were lower today, which was not uh, not surprising considering the jump in grain prices. Live cattle, for the most part, held in there today as well. Uh, what are you seeing in cattle as we start this week, Brian? Well, let's start with the feeders. You know, they've had a nice little rally here from beginning of May. Um, corn prices peaked in May, and so you got that inverse relationship. And feeder cattle peaking last week at their highest price since March. Um, what, I think there's a fundamental story in the feeder market that you have a limited supply, you had poor pasture conditions. I think my guess is we probably have more heifers going to the feed or into, um, to the uh, slaughter pipeline. And, and so I think the, the cattle market probably is well supported. 
well supported though doesn't mean it has to go higher and that's that's where the market's kind of laid laid kind of a big zero here the last couple of weeks the live market just it kind of ran out of gas and now it's pulled back a little bit especially in those front months um i think something like the april contract here within striking distance of the high less than maybe two dollars i think that will eventually take the high out i think i think that live market on the deferred months has it right i just think with this whole covid business and some tensions with china it's really hard in the very near term to be overly optimistic on anything right now there's just too much uncertainty floating around out there but i think the big picture definitely wants to view longer term demand and in the cattle market maybe limited supply brian uh, how about the dairy market any thoughts for us there as we start the week you know it's it's a market that's been sort of um one week looking like the world is coming to an end the next week recover uh we had pretty good recovery today with some higher cheese prices today you got the august contract 1787 that looked like it was on the brink of disaster down closer to 1650 a little more than a week ago. It's come back so far. Uh, production number was up well over 4% this last month. Looks like we've got more cows on hand. We held them back. Not surprising when you have high milk prices. Um, so we got some, some near-term uh, recovery and looks kind of impressive, but I don't know if we've got a bull market in the wings here. I, I think this dairy industry has got to struggle. Um, and so the question is, well, what, you know, what's going to make it run, run higher? Well, it might have to be higher corn prices because cheaper corn prices aren't going to make dairy, you know, producers excited to, you know, liquidate the herd. There'd be no reason for that. They're probably excited to try and add a few. Um, so, so demand has to be there. Um, again, this post-COVID thing, is it a buy the rumor, sell the fact? It seems like the dairy industry believes so. Uh, so we'll probably get some jump up here in price, but don't expect to be long-lived. Uh, we think the market overheated itself the last couple of times more on support from government programs than it did on actual supply and demand long-term variables driving um, driving um, uh, both cow numbers and overall just demand for the consumer well brian i know it's uh, been a busy monday appreciate the time as always any other final thoughts you have for us today well i think if uh you know i'm a corn corn producer and i can look out my back window and then look at the calendar if i've got a pretty good looking crop in moisture conditions um you know i still want to encourage uh that person or if that's me i'm starting to really look at what what you know, I, realistically, I know things can happen. But realistically, what happens if you have an average to above average yield? How much do you want to, at these prices, not defend? So either forward sell some more, or buy a put. Um, I I think you know the whole commodity complex this last month looked on shaky ground, and whether it's a correction or just overvalued things. I always worry about the overvalued things, especially head toward a harvest. So if you've got good looking crop and you're confident, get a little more sold. Make sure and get 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 out in front of this. If you know how, you're only a phone call away from owning whatever you want to own. So it doesn't have to be in a storage bin, but you can own it in a heartbeat if you know how to do it. Well, and for those who need a little help, maybe don't know quite how to do it, they can reach out to you and the team there at Total Farm Marketing, I'm sure, to get that advice. You guys have a lot of ways to connect, but I know uh, an old-fashioned phone call is always the best way to start, isn't it? It is. 800-334-9779. Uh, nothing beats a good conversation. You can kind of hear and visualize and see, you know, with your senses and uh those are really important things. Uh, nothing wrong with written communication, but sometimes the interpretation can get easily lost. 800-334-9779 or the website as well, totalfarmmarketing.com. Brian, appreciate the time as always. Thanks for joining us on this Monday. We'll talk to you next week. Yes, sir. We thank you. Appreciate Brian the opportunity. Do you bet. Brian Doherty with Total Farm Marketing. That's going to do it for Market Talk on this Monday, July 12th, brought to you by Growmark FS. I'm your host, Jesse Allen, wishing you a great afternoon.